There you go. Thank you. Before I make my sentencing remarks, I, as I had advised the court, I am going to ask the various um, loved ones of Ezra McCandless to address the court, and I have informed them because I didn't know when I talked to them previously that they're to come and speak from the witness stand. I also just want to state for the record that the reason we had a sidebar is because I have uncontrollable asthma, and that fortunately I haven't gone into a coughing fit yet, but... Um, I might while speaking, and therefore I have water and an inhaler at my table. Um, but it is, if I do cough, it is not out of disrespect for anybody in this courtroom, for the court, for the prosecutor, for the loved ones of Alex Woodworth or Ms. McCandless or anybody else. Thank you. Um, the first person who has, um, I'm going to ask to speak uh, was a witness in the case, Don Sipple. Mr. Sipple? You'll have to excuse me, my walk is a little slow. First off, I want to tell you I'm not here to take sides. I've been an observer of this whole situation going on two years now. Pretty close by. Ezra came to my door at 4.15 on March 22nd, 1918. She asked me to, when I, when I answered the door, she asked me to take her to the hospital and caught me off guard and I didn't know quite what to say. A few minutes later, why she said I was assaulted. Then I knew what to do. I brought her into the house, got a chair out of the living room. This was a... Uh, utility room where, we, where the door was and got her into the utility room, got a chair out of the, the dining area and and put her in a chair and I called 911. I think some of you have already seen that but I thought I'd just, just <coughs> remind you again. 911 people came there in probably 10, 12 minutes and they took care of it after that. <coughs> But one thing I did here, uh, uh, late November, I didn't know what what prompted me to do it, but I, I wrote Ezra a letter at the jail. And a couple, three weeks later, the 6th of December, she responded with a big brown envelope and a letter and two different pieces of art like I've never seen before. She drew them herself. That was the nicest art I've ever seen and one of the nicest letters I've ever seen. And after I read them all, I wish you guys could see them, the letters I still have them. We continued on and now there's five total letters back and forth. I sure wish you could see them. But the first letter I got <coughs> Don't happen too easy for me, but it caught, brought me to tears, the letter I got from her. We all make mistakes in this world. If you haven't, you haven't done much. But hopefully we learn by the mistakes. I'm sure you all can think of something, maybe some more than one, but we've all made some mistakes. All I can hope for Ezra is that someday she can come out of this and be a beautiful, wonderful citizen in our area. I'm sure hoping that might happen. I've had some other contact with some of her people just recently and, and learned some new things about this whole deal and I won't bring that up now, but it, it'll, it would surprise you. 
I pray for her often, pretty much every day. I hope down the road that we'll still be friends no matter what happens here today. Hope that we'll still be friends. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Thank you very much. Judge, the next person who I'm going to ask to speak is Sharita Shackensee. She also wrote a letter to the court. She's not going to read her full letter to the court because it's been filed, but she'd like to say a few words. All right, and uh, uh, please state your name and spell it once you're, uh, uh, before you begin, okay? Okay. Yes, well, what it, uh, Shock and C. Davis, S-H-E-R-Y-D-A, S-H-O-C-K-E-N-C-Y hyphen Davis, okay, D-A-V-I-S. Uh, okay, um, well, uh, I guess the best place for me to start. I uh, met Ezra when I was incarcerated here in Dunn County. Um, <clears throat> I was incarcerated for a third DUI um, that I had received after a very long, painful divorce I went through. It's not something I normally talk about, so I apologize. Um, I went into jail thinking that was it. I had no friends, no family I really felt connected with, no real reason to kind of, you know, have a positive outlook on life and uh, try and find a new door to open that, you know, I could put myself through. Um, I also had the intentions of, of serving my time without making any friends in jail because of all of these um, common misconceptions that we get, you know, with society and being incarcerated. And uh, that, that wasn't the case. It didn't happen like that. I, I tried. Um, prior to even serving my sentence, I bore this mentality that I would shut everybody out and I would do myself and I would get by just fine if I believed that in my heart, and it, it didn't work out that way. Um, I shut a lot of people out, and when I met Ezra, she kind of shined this light on me that, that I didn't want to see. I, you know, I had thrown myself so far into the darkness, and she was just this, this positive light that showed me there was more than one door I could go through and that there were positive things on the other side of these doors and you know if I shut out the world then I'm, I'm shutting out all of the things in the world that are great you know love and life and friendship family true meanings um, that I'm sure everybody has, has found at one point or another in their lives um, <clears throat> My background, other than that, really wasn't uh, terrible. It was difficult to get through, sure, uh, with the divorce. Um, you know, it was a loss of, of a partner and children, and it was uh, something that I, like I said, I really, I don't talk much about it because it really kind of still bears with me. But over the last year itself with just knowing her and, and seeing this light and seeing this this person that you know went through this this thing in their lives that it, by my book is far worse than what I've gone through um, and you know she was still able to to cast light cast positivity you know show me reasons why I myself can continue going forward um, it's, it's really helped me a lot uh, especially this last year um, I was drinking a lot and I was suicidal and I've come away from that a lot now I have a lot of different reasons now on why I believe that I can go forward and um, you know Ezra still to this day does that um, she really she's helped me a lot she saved me she saved everything good about me, 
She helped me see the bad things that I, I didn't think I could change, that I, I, I now know I can. And I just, I don't know where I'd be today, having not spent that time with her, having not gotten to know her so that I could relearn who I was myself. And I just, I'm forever grateful. And I, I, I don't really know what else to say, but I can tell you for sure that my life is forever changed and I don't think I could ever repay her for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next thing we're going to do is um, read a letter from Joe Shane Carlin. He is Ezra's father. He testified in the trial and to, in order to save my voice, Judge, I have asked Mr. Nelson if he could please read it for me. Again, this is a letter from uh, Joshane Carlin. Ladies and gentlemen, I've worked in corrections for 20 plus years now, and I've seen and dealt with people you never want to meet on the street or any other walk of life. These people are cold, violent, and sometimes brutal. No matter what picture Ms. Nodolf has painted for you, Ezra is not one of these. She is not like any of these people. In fact, Hundreds of people could tell you that she's just the opposite. She loves to a fault and sees the good in everyone she meets. When I say that she loves to a fault, I mean that literally is in that she trusts people even though she's vulnerable to, even those she's vulnerable to without even knowing she's being used, abused, or mistreated. She sometimes stays in relationships longer than she should, and at some point things reach the tipping point. Another thing to note is that in these 20 plus years in corrections, I've worked side by side with offenders in my custody. Some of these people have been in prison longer than they were alive before getting locked up. Many have matured greatly, some unfortunately have not. Ezra has never once denied she did this or said, I didn't do it. In fact, she accepted her role in this all and has faced it all head on while enduring comments on her character. One common denominator in all those that I've worked with over the years is that no matter how long you keep them incarcerated, you can't teach those any more in 20 years than you can in five or 10. All you do after five or 10 years is turn a person bitter, angry, and never wanting to change for the better or strive for success. Ezra is bearing the burden of the horrific memories of that day, and she will continue to do so each and every day of her life. She will bear that burden on every single birthday, Christmas, holidays, family events, and every waking moment she's away, we, her family, bear it too. Sentencing a young person like this to life without parole is not only a mistake, but a huge loss for everyone who loves her. By offering Ezra an eligibility date, you offer her a chance to be a productive contributor to society which ultimately is our goal in the Department of Corrections. Don't just make her, don't make her just a name and number tag on a door for the rest of her life. Remember, she is a beautiful human being that is loved by many and give her another opportunity at this chaotic ride we all call life. Please give her a, the chance, a chance to benefit all of us who love her and to let her come home to be a big sister daughter, niece, granddaughter that we all want and need in our lives because with her we are all blessed. To all of you here today in support of Alex, I am so sorry to all of you who've lost your son, grandson, nephew, or friend. I want you all to know that a great many nights I've prayed for you all and wish that I could shake your hand or hug you and tell you that I'm sorry for your loss. Know that all of you that I really am sorry for your loss. Today and every day, I pray that you somehow find peace. I also pray that you find a way to find forgiveness. I'm not asking you to forget Alex by any means, but I'm asking you to find a way to find some peace. You deserve peace. Although my family hasn't experienced the same loss you have, we too are experiencing a huge loss in all of this. Ezra has parents like myself, family, siblings, and many friends.
that really want to see her come home someday. May you all find peace, and I sincerely hope the court hears my words and takes them into consideration upon making the decision about Ezra's sentence today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Um, Debbie Carlin, who is Ezra McCandless's grandmother and Joe Shane's mother, wanted to address the court. <laughs> I'm Ezra's grandmother. And this dear child came into my life when she was four years old. She asked me to be her grandma, but I, I was already in love with her by then. You, Alex's family, have loved Alex with all your heart and have made beautiful memories. And I love my Ezra with all my heart, with all my being. And I've made some beautiful memories. This child who the court has addressed as a mean, vicious person, this child in second grade Save some birds in a nest. Put them in her pocket because the nest had fallen on the ground and they took. she took them to school in her pocket. I got a call from school. The teacher said, we've got baby birds in the, in the pocket. And Ezra had all her friends gathering worms at recess so she could feed those baby birds. Then my dear granddaughter rescued a poor, starving, stinky billy goat from a farmer. She rescued that stinky old animal on the verge of death. She brought him home as a pet and groomed him. And she gave him baths and led him around. And then she'd come and give me a hug and she'd stink just like that billy goat. But she thought it was the best thing in the world because she saved him. On the playground, there was never a child left behind when Ezra was there. Never. She always made friends. And if she seen somebody alone, guess who she went to sit with at lunch? That child sitting alone. This beautiful child always thought of everybody else before herself. And she became a young lady. And she could never see wrong in anyone. Anyone. She always found good. The children at school, the kids that were picked on, she found good in all of them. And she sat with them, walked through the halls with them. As a young lady, she loved unconditionally. She loved everybody, absolutely everybody. She could never say anything bad. And I just want you to know that is the Ezra. That is my granddaughter. She loves life. And I love her. Thank you. I've been told that um, Tara Carlin, um, who is one of Joe Shane's sisters and Ezra's aunt, would like to briefly address the court. All right. Would you please just state your name and spell it for the court reporter yes. before you begin? Sure. It's Tara, T-A-R-A, Codal, K-O-D-L. Thank you. You may begin whenever you're ready. I'm Ezra's aunt. She actually, I met her when she was four years old. We went out to dinner. My brother introduced her to me. And the first thing she says to me is, I'm four years old and I don't need to ride in a car seat anymore. Granted, laws have changed now and she'd still be in a car seat. But that was the joy for life and the zest. And she was always smiling and she loved nature. Fast forward now to first grade. My brother adopts her. I already thought of her as my niece, but I was the one who was picked to pick her up from school that day. So I went to the school, went to the door, 
with the balloon. I don't even know if she remembers this. But the balloon said, it's a girl. They didn't say happy adoption. They didn't have that for balloons, but she was my niece. Loved her, and it was official. A few years later, she was in school a little further, and I was living down the road from my mom and my dad, and down the road from my brother and her mom. And Ezra would come stay at my house after school. We'd hang out while I was teaching piano lessons. Never had to worry about her. She took care of my cat, whatever. And then she gets to high school. By now I'm married, have two children. And I gave her the biggest job ever. She was my nanny for two whole summers. The kids are 20 months apart and can be a handful. She kept them on the go. They would go to the library. They would go for walks, go to the pool. She'd get them to summer school, get them to their swimming lessons, ride bike, explore nature, everything. Draw, oh my gosh, the pictures they would draw in color and paint, every art imaginable. The main thing she did not do is plop them in front of a TV. That was not an option. Electronics, TV, they weren't turned on when Ezra was around. You were outside, you were drawing, you were doing art, you were experiencing life. I would not let anybody just watch my children. I'm actually pretty picky when it comes to that. And I trusted Ezra for two whole summers. She only had to call and cancel on me twice, which when you're in high school and freshman in college, that's pretty amazing, I think. She was sick, so. But right away the next day, she was there, always on time, very reliable. And then, when she was in college, we stayed in touch, we talked. She was really good to my girls, always had a smile for them. I knew I could count on Ezra if something would come up, if she was in the area. Ezra would never intentionally harm anyone. And to this day, I still trust her with my children. And I love you. Thank you. Trinity, does Trinity Harlan want to address the court? No, Smith. Trinity Smith, I'm sorry. I'm using maiden names. Does Trinity Smith want to address the court? Sure. Okay. Trinity Smith is also another one of Ezra McCandless's aunts um, and Joe Carlin's. Okay, you can come forward. I was just told this morning she wanted. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I made the mistake. She's her aunt on her maternal side. Okay, Rose, if you would, Lena Gellison's sister. All right, just please state your name and spell it for the court reporter before you begin. Sure, it's Trinity, T R I N I T Y, last name Smith, S M I T H. Go ahead whenever you're ready. My name is Trinity, and I became an aunt to Ezra when I was seven years old. Um, I had no idea what it meant to be an aunt. I was just excited that there was a baby to play with. Um, Ezra has always been and has had an infectious smile, and you'd see her and you'd feel love and joy. Um, I'm sorry. She always loved playing outside and bringing in all that nature has to offer. It could be worms, frogs, a grass snake, which is terrifying, or pretty flowers, and no matter what, she just loved it all. I moved away when I was 11 to live with my dad, so I didn't get to see her that much. Um, but when I did, she used to follow me everywhere. I used to complain to Rosie that um, she would never leave me alone, and I regret, I regret that. Um, I would give anything to have her as my shadow. As we used to, um, tell me that I should never have kids because then she wouldn't be my favorite. And she's very wrong because my love for her has only grown. Have you ever loved something so much you're afraid to look away because it might not be there? 
Every time I would see her, I would just scream her name because I was so happy and I would squeeze her so tight. And she would just let me and she would just be, tell me I love you too. And she would be like, I love you too, Antrin. And she would just keep telling me until I was ready to let her go. She's one of the most thoughtful, caring, generous, and kind-hearted people I know. She often said to me that she just wishes people could just be kind and love each other. I can't remember her ever saying an unkind word or passing judgment on a person. I've only seen acceptance, kindness, love, and compassion towards others. Ezra is a good person, and she brings joy to others through her artwork and her personality and her acts of kindness. And I'm very proud to be her aunt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, James Gunnelson, who is married to Ezra's mother, would like to address the court. I should have said Dr. James Gunnelson. Well, I'm James Gunnelson. I'm Ezra's stepfather. Can you um, speak up a little bit? Yes. Um, I'd like to start by giving my deepest, um, sincere sympathy to Alex and his family and loved ones. Um, it's the last couple of years have been a nightmare, and um, uh, what, what I would like to talk about is is Ezra. Um, Ezra was 12 years old when when I met her when I started dating her mother, and. Um, I moved in and I lived with her when she was 13 and I lived with her every day from then on basically until she went to, to college. Um, I was at most of the pre-trial um, appearance, court appearances and um, as much of the trial as I could make. The characterization of Ezra has been that she's deceitful and a liar and just a bad person but the person that I've got to know through all my years with her is it couldn't be farther from the truth from how she's been characterized throughout this she's a, a kind a loving a, a very helpful person she has a huge huge heart um, she has two younger siblings um, and she, who she loves very much and who love her very much. And she, one example of, of her love for her siblings, when she was in Marionette, she would still drive back to watch her little brother play elementary sports, which you guys watch, that's not overly exciting, but kind of the funny thing about that is that one thing is Ezra hated driving and so she usually had someone else drive for her just because she really didn't like it she was terrified of getting into a car accident every time she was in a car and she doesn't even like sports I mean, she she would just do it to make sure that her brother could see her there and show that bond and try to keep that bond going even though she had moved away um, she'd also throughout middle school throughout high school she always would help her help her little brother help her little sister um when her brother would be doing homework sitting down at the table she'd sit down unprovoked unasked just see if she could help just you know what, what are you working on can i help and just whatever she could do she she would do it with her little sister um she taught her the the joy of music and of art and I would come home from work some days and my littlest girl would just come running up to me beaming with a smile and <coughs> say Ezra showed me these coolest songs and they'd be they were listening to baby Einstein music and um, dancing and singing for hours all day and as soon as I got home they had to play the music for me to you know, let me enjoy, you know, get a part of the joy that they've been, been having. And they'd spend hours coloring chalk on the sidewalk, just in front. And 
as you would be making these masterpieces that you know, you'd take pictures of because they were so beautiful. And our youngest one would just have little scribbles all over, and it was, it was just fun. And Ezra would help her, and she'd turn her little scribbles into something a little more, you know, a little more fun that she could be proud of and say, "Daddy, look at what I made! Look at what I made!" And it is just so helpful with with our youngest and. She's also fostered a love of books and of, of learning with our with our littlest girl. Even even over these last couple of years, um, Ezra has put in the effort to purchase books, write notes in them, and get them to our youngest daughter so she can still keep that bond going. And she'll have videos of her reading the books so they can still try to continue that and. Um, it's, it's really hard on our youngest because she doesn't understand what's going on but as is still still trying she's still making that effort um, while Ezra was in middle school and high school she was amazing she was incredibly helpful around the house um, her mother and I both worked full time. She had two younger siblings that um, need a lot of attention and care. Um, we didn't have to worry about cleaning the house. Ezra would do it without us even asking. Um, to the point she'd get the kitchen so clean that she would get upset when I'd come home to start cooking because I'd have to take the pots out and make them clean again. <laughs> but um, she'd also she also helped us with our office and with our work. She'd come over, she'd keep the lawn mowed, she'd shovel for us. She just all, um, a lot of just little jobs that she knew that she could help and she wasn't getting compensated for and she would just do it just to make our lives easier. Um, she would see times when her mother and I would be feeling um, a little worn down from work and she would offer, say, hey, do you guys want to go out tonight and have a date and I'll watch the kids. And, um, you know, that was amazing to me because it's not something that I typically would expect, you know, a teenager to give up their Fridays and Saturday nights to, to volunteer. And um, it was always important to me. I mean, she's always been very, very important. Um, Personality-wise, um, Ezra's a very optimistic person. She always sees the, the good in life. And it, it seems like a lot of that has been misconstrued. Um, but that's, that's kind of the, the person she is. When she's nervous or she's feeling stressed, she likes to smile and she giggles and laughs. And um, that's her way to... That, that she copes with stress and that's another thing if you don't know her well you can take that a wrong direction but she's the, the years that I've known her she, I've never seen her um, I've never seen her violent I've never seen her act out out of anger um, I've seen her angry um, and when she did when she was she was usually um, retreat to her room and just calm down and we'd see her um, we'd see her later and she'd be fine again you know she you know she's she's not the type of person that um, is looking for vengeance or or um, that's just not that's not the character that I have seen um, through my 10 years of, of knowing Ezra um, you know, I I do know, looking to the future, that Ezra will continue to improve herself as the kind of person that Ezra is. She she always wants to make herself better. And she wants to make the people around her better, and she wants to make um, wherever she is a better place for everyone involved. Um, and I know that if she is given a chance. She will do that same thing with within society to make society a better place. Because that's 
who she is as a person. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gunnelson's father, David Gunnelson, wants to address the court. And then I have only one more person after that. All right. I'm David Gunnelson, and I just want to talk about the Ezra I know, but before that I'd like to say, Ezra, I love you, and we love you. The Ezra I know, you know, she's, very, she's a nice person, she's a very nice person. When she had come to visit us, you know, she, she's a nature lover too. If you, if you know Ezra, she knows she just loves nature. When she'll come to visit us, she'll be walking in the woods, she'll be looking at the woods, she'll be seeing, she'll be seeing like, you know, sometimes I wonder where is she, but she'll be, she'll be out exploring. You know, that's, that's what, that's, I think that's who Ezra is. The Ezra I knew was kind. She's very kind. She's, uh, the animals, the birds, the ducks, you know, when we were at the lakes, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, she's, uh, I've seen her carry bugs out of the house where she wouldn't have to wash them. When we're fishing, you know, she, when we're fishing, it didn't matter if we caught any fish, she'd just be out there enjoying every minute. She would not use a minnow, she would not use a worm. It's just a plug, just a little plastic thing, or a plug or a rapala. In her, in her writing, she once uh, told me how she, how she got the name Ezra. And I, I want to read this too. From a trip up north on a weekend spent with her family, the day was perfect with her family on the water and the people I love. I saw the name Ezra in a book and I thought to myself, how oh, that name is, is the wonderful feeling is the wonderful feeling I had that day. The Ezra I know is a listener. She, she's hearing what people have to say. She's not bringing the conversation back to, well, it's all about me. She's interested. She's asking questions. The Ezra I know loves her family. And her family gatherings, she knows the, she loves the people. She wants to all of this family, she just wants to get to know better. She, she loves being a part of everything. It's lifting and sharing. I think it's all about family. She loves old things. You know, it, uh, they may not be valuable, but, you know, for example, my, my deceased brother had a, a painting where you put a painting, much like this one, and, and uh, she was overjoyed to get it. Not so much just to have that, but just to be a family. She loves grandma's old hats. Old hurricane lamps. I think Ezra has a sense of family. Since uh, since her arrest, we have written written many lang many many letters. You know, and and uh, the letters have become. You know, what what do we talk about? We talk about nature, of course, and we talk about the things we've seen, seen and done. We've talked about the books we've read. Some of the authors we like, some of the authors we share we like. And we talk about our faith in God. We talk about our faith. Almost every letter, the majority of letters, we talk about Bible verses. Ezra says how they've touched her, how they've touched her heart. Every day I pray for Ezra. Every day I pray for Alex's family. Because it's, the prayers are the same. I pray that we can receive this sense and understanding of God's perfect justice, of God's perfect mercy, and then we can receive this into our hearts. And then we will all be filled with God's comfort, filled with His kindness, and filled with God's healing. And that way we can be returned to a wholeness that we had before. Thank you. 
Thank you. The last person who's going to make a statement is Rosalina Gonelson, Ezra's mother. Okay. All right. Ms. Gonelson, how do you spell your first name? R O S E L E N N A. Thank you. I would like to start today with, I am truly sorry for the loss of a son, a grandson, a brother, a nephew and a friend. Multiple times a day, I wish that ex Alex and Ezra never met each other. I truly feel no one wins in this case. I am Ezra's mother, but Ezra has always had more, has always had a more evolved soul than I. Ezra taught me so many things, so many lessons on love and acceptance. At a very young age, about five years old, I learned a hard lesson about telling the truth. My mother was on her second marriage and her husband was an alcoholic. My mother had decided that she wanted to visit some family in Chicago. And at the time, we only had one vehicle, so my mother had asked a friend to take us. I think it was an overnight trip, but I was five, so I don't recall much. What I do remember is that we came home that night, and my stepfather was waiting, and he asked me, where did you guys go? Who took you there? As a five-year-old, you tell the truth no matter what. So I told my stepfather we went with mom's friend to grandpa's house. My stepfather told me and my sister to go to our room. And I went to my room and I stood at the door and I watched my mother get physically assaulted. And all I could do was stand there and know I was next. The next day, I was told by my mother, I was the reason my stepfather hurt us. I got her in trouble because I told where we went and with whom. And after that day, I knew the truth would not protect me or my family, and I loved the family I loved. And I built a wall to protect myself from harm. I shut off feelings to survive an unloving and abusive childhood. The day I gave birth to Ezra, my wall came crashing down. I felt love for the first time. Even though Ezra was just born, I felt Ezra loved me more than I could love her. Growing up, Ezra was so sensitive and caring to others, I couldn't wrap my head around it. Ezra would accept anyone for who they are and we get to know them before passing judgment. I was guarded. I wanted so much for Ezra to share that untrusting sense that I had with everyone I came to be around. Ezra would engage in conversation with anyone and give them the benefit of the doubt when all I had was doubt. I was 14 years old when I gave birth to Ezra. And at 17, I moved out of my third stepfather's house. I spent most of the time at school and then work, where Ezra spent most of her time at daycare and at a babysitter. Where years later, I found out about the sexual abuse Ezra had endured. I had no idea how to be a mom. And a good mom is what every child deserves. I feel no one should be a parent at 14 years old. Parenting is so hard. And at 36, I make it a full-time job on learning how to be a better mom. I was truly given a blessing when I had Ezra. I have a child who cares more about making someone else feel loved, valued, and accepted before loved 
valued and accepted themselves. When I got married to Joe, Ezra's adopted father, we had completely different views on parenting. And we would both verbally abuse each other every day. I know now I was not a good wife and not a good mother for staying in a very unhealthy environment. I put myself and my child in the same situation my mother put me in as a child without the physical abuse. But there was verbal abuse. And for some people, it is the same. Ezra had to live in a home where two people were not happy. I got pregnant because I thought at the time it would be better for our marriage. I almost died carrying my son. My body was shutting down. I was in and out of the hospital frequently and even had a nurse come to our house to change IVs. All of this was really hard on Ezra. I was not well enough to give her the attention she deserved. And as soon as I was able, I was back to work because we needed the money. Not once did Ezra complain about having to stay at Grandma and Grandpa's. My son was bored. And Ezra was so excited, first, to not have me sick anymore, but second, because she had someone to hold and play with. <laughs> Ezra and my son were many years apart, and she was so very patient with a very rambunctious little boy. <laughs> when my son was school age, Ezra would be willing, more than willing, to help with homework and especially art projects because Ezra is a natural artist. I remember the day my son had to make a rocket for school and Ezra volunteered to help almost immediately. I never had to force Ezra to help her siblings, but I also never made it a point to force Ezra to help with the si at the time because I remembered how much I disliked having to entertain my siblings at the time. Joe and I went through a messy divorce. Ezra chose to stay with me full time and we shared custody of our son. As a parent, to only see your child half time is extremely difficult. And it makes you question if you had made the right decision. Divorce is extremely hard on kids, having to go back and forth living two different worlds because both households are completely different. I remarried when Ezra was 15. I had my child about a year or so after my last child about a year or so after, as was, was so attentive to my youngest. Hardly left her side some days. Ezra bonded very quickly with our youngest. It was so beautiful to experience the love they have. I feel they helped each other on hard days. <laughs> High school was not easy for Ezra. Ezra did not want to draw attention to herself, so she dressed more masculine which was thought to be the solution and, and it was more difficult because the small town we live in is not accepting of gender fluidity. fluidity. I remember the day Ezra came home sobbing and, and scared to tell me how she was feeling about gender. I made sure Ezra knew I would stand beside you whatever you decide. I love my children and I am accepting of whatever makes them comfortable. I admire Ezra's strength. I preach a lot about you only having one life to live. Live how you want and not for anyone else. I feel things were a little easier after our discussion happened and even though we had tough times during high school, we had some really good times. Listening to alternative music and we would just sit in the kitchen and talk. We talked about new and old music, different movies and we were that were coming out and watch YouTube videos and just belly laugh. Ezra has the most infectious laugh and smile. Ezra always Ezra's laugh always made my day better. I remember the day we did Ezra's senior pictures. It was just Ezra and I and we spent all day in the woods taking hundreds of pictures. It was one of my most favorite memories. Ezra was the kind of person who was 
in tune with energy. If someone gives off negative energy, Ezra is the kind of person that will try their best to make them feel better. Before March of 2018, Ezra was working as a teacher's assistant and the counselor at that school requested Ezra work with a child who was having trouble with their gender identity. Ezra was great at making you feel okay to be who you are on the inside. I literally call my blessings every day. And when your child is going through the worst times of their life and you can't hold them and tell them it's going to be okay, I feel like I failed as a parent because it is my job to protect my children. Being within arm's length and you can't even hold hands was one of many hard parts of this for me. Ezra is not the kind of person to intentionally kill. And I am not the kind of person to sit here and to support someone who could. I am asking your honor to give the gift of a minimum of 20 years for all. And I understand that that does not mean parole will ever even happen and that Ezra will ever come home. Thank you for allowing me and my family to speak today. Thank you. All right, Ms. Vishnu, you may proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you. Judge, we come to this court to ask mercy, but not to ask leniency, because in fact, leniency is not this court's to give. The sentence before the court must be one of life. The only decision that this court has to make is whether or not in the future somebody will look at the facts, the circumstances, and have the wisdom to take a look at things at a future moment, at who Ezra McCandless is at a future moment at what happened at a future moment. And that is why I asked the court for Ezra McCandless to have the opportunity to petition at the first possible chance. And one might call that merciful, but it is certainly not lenient because in fact, it is unknowable what will ever happen in this case. In the year 2000, the state legislature changed the sentencing paradigm for all sentences, not just homicide. And at that time, the state legislature made a decision that when it came to a first degree intentional homicide, that the minimum required sentence was one of 20 years. It did not lay down a <coughs> mandatory time for which after 20 years, one could not necessarily be released from the imprisonment portion of a bifurcated sentence. A first degree intentional homicide with the opportunity to petition at 20 years, this is the first time that those petitions will come before a court. In all likelihood, they will not come before the judges who sentenced the person. They will not see the young person, whether a teenager or a young adult, who committed the offense. The, the prosecutor will not be the same prosecutor. The defense lawyer won't be the same defense lawyer. And all of this is true in Ezra McCandless's case as well. Because there's nothing that I'm going to say that is going to denigrate the verdict that this jury handed down. This jury listened to three weeks of testimony, and they made a decision. They made a decision based on the jury instructions of the great state of Wisconsin that intent is formed not an hour, not a day, but just can be formed in the moment before an act. That it need not be brooded upon or reflected upon, but can occur immediately before what happened. And when I take a look at this offense, I ask this court to sentence appropriately under the law. As the case of United States v. Klubal, K-L-U-B-A-L-L, -L, 843 F3rd, 719, the Seventh Circuit case says, the court is not to sentence on speculation, but on the facts. 
I have spoken with several of the jurors in this particular case, and while I have promised confidentiality and not to mention their names, I am satisfied through my discussions with the jurors, and I say this with one of the jurors' consent, that what the jury arrived at in their verdict was they found the intent to kill ex existed. They rejected Ezra McCandless's testimony. They found there was an intent to kill from the scene and the evidence presented of the scene. The jury did not make findings as to whether this was premeditated, uh, regarding the relationship. One of the jurors said there was a lot of other noise in the case. They focused their attention on what they could from the scene, what happened in the car, and from the number of stab wounds, and therefore they found intent. They did reject Ezra McCandless's testimony. I understand that. That's why Ezra McCandless, at a minimum, will spend as much time in the Wisconsin state prison system as she has lived since her mother birthed her. And that's what this court is to sentence on. I don't know exactly what set this chain of events into motion. What I can tell and what the court allowed in for the limited purpose of understanding Ezra McCandless's state of mind at the time of the stabbing were the memorandums that she had written that she was sharing with her friends or her diaries, if somebody wants to say that. Ezra McCandless said, I recognize the actions that were in my control and the ones out of my control. I've been on a path of self-destruction for a long time. Ezra McCandless talked about betraying the one she loved. Ezra McCandless talked about the fact that Ezra McCandless had been suicidal, had been in, in the depths, had wanted to make a change in Ezra McCandless's life. McCandless wrote in Ezra McCandless's journey, I don't accept the past actions, but recognize them and only want to work to finding who I truly am. I cannot hurt myself anymore. I cannot hurt the ones I love. I can become Ezra McCandless again. That's what Ezra McCandless wrote. In the journal that the state took a slight excerpt out of, where Ezra McCandless talked about that Ezra McCandless would consider suicide daily, that Ezra McCandless's mind, as, as Ezra wrote, my mind would tell me I'm a failure and a monster, become one of them. It sickens me to recall the words I would say so often. I know I can love. I know I can only strive to never do this again. Ezra McCandless and Alex Woodworth were both broken people in many ways. And I'm not saying this to equate the position they're in, because Alex has lost his life, and his family has suffered the greatest loss and the greatest tragedy of them all. What I'm saying is that, you'll have to excuse me for drinking water, but I need it. What I'm saying, and what these letters show that the state has produced, is that Ezra McCandless was in some kind of state of mind that was driven by her past. And this isn't a matter of blaming everybody. I'm sure Ezra's parents did the best they could, but she was raised in a very hectic environment. She was told when she was young that if she cried when she was being dressed down or being told she was stupid or doing something she shouldn't be doing, that I'll give you something to cry about. So Ezra McCandless did not show very much emotion when on the witness stand in court. That's not the basis of judging what the sentence should be. It's not the basis of judging what the sentence, what she looked at, how she looked at a person who she had at one point in her life been deeply in love with, even though that person, her boyfriend, Jason Mingle, had been extremely abusive to her, as we had seen from the testimony of Jenna Van Zant and through Ezra McCandless's own writings as to how he treated her. She perceived her relationships in a certain way with her, her relationship in particular with Alex Woodworth. And the one thing I want to say about Alex and Ezra was it's remarkable how much Ezra in her life has been like Alex. I was going to read uh, lines here and there from the letters I filed with the court. I'm not going to do that because I'm confident, Your Honor, that you've read them already. And we've certainly had plenty of time for people from Ezra's family, people who know her, to address this court. From people who've known her her whole life to people who've more recently met her, um, such as the young woman who she helped while she was in jail, Sharita. 
But they were very much both broken people, and they found each other. And the fact is, is that they were in love with each other. I'm not saying it was good. I don't know how it ended. But the one thing that is clear to me is it makes absolutely no sense to say that Ezra McCandless lured Alex into a deserted place in order to murder him, that she murdered his reputation, that she... Um, went there to force him into a confession that their relationship was an accident. That is the stuff of fantasy. That may be good fodder for a closing argument, but the jury found Ezra McCandless guilty because they rejected her testimony, looked at the stab wounds, and said this death was done intentionally, and they did not believe that it was self-defense, and they did not believe her testimony. So the question is, where do you go from here? With these two people, they had a feeling of being on the outside of their communities that they both grew up in for various reasons. They both were non-mainstream in terms of sexuality and gender certain feelings. They had the same circle of friends. They had artistic endeavors. Alex's artistry was his writing, his philosophy. Ezra's artistry was and is the visual arts and photographer. It's interesting to me, and what attracted Ezra to Alex was his kindness to other people. In their first conversation, he talked about his love of spiders. And Ezra, as you can see, had a love of even the humble spider or a bird that had fallen from a nest. They had thoughts, both of them, of self-harm and self-destruction. As, so as far as the gravity of the offense, every homicide is extremely grave. But not every homicide leads to a life without the possibility of supervision. And by the way, the pre-sentence writer is, in my opinion, my humble opinion, really asking for life without supervision when you look at life expectancy statistics for people in prison, which I have provided the court in our memo, which was amply footnoted if the court wished to peruse further. I want to talk about what... And I don't want to do a statistical comparison of other sentences, but I do want to talk about two other cases. But I have sat through this process, and I have supervised other people on their homicide cases and was the statewide homicide practice group coordinator, or one might say mentor, for other lawyers with their homicide cases. I have watched hundreds of people walk into a courtroom and share their pain a person who lists as a parent, a brother, a sister, a friend, a gang member. That pain is all equivalent. But the court's job is not equivalent. The court's job is to look at the facts and the circumstances of each particular homicide and to make a decision, understanding and knowing that our legislature in its wisdom has said there is a price to pay, and that's 20 years of your life. And 20 years is really a long, long time. I don't want to belabor the significance of it. I ask every person in this courtroom to think about your life 20 years ago and what it was like and what you did that you were embarrassed about and what you did that was wrong or what you did that seems naive, or seems silly, or seems like a bad choice. Those 20 years, Ezra McCandless must spend behind bars, removed from society. And as we know, except for this one day of this life, where she killed Alex Woodworth, she lived a pretty exemplary life. She didn't have a criminal record. She was kind whether it was to bugs, birds, animals, her family, her siblings, her friends, other human beings in the jail with her. She was kind to them. Something happened on this day. We know she had mental health issues. We know she had been in counseling. We know she suffered from having been sexually abused, not once but twice as a young person and had never, like so many young kids, ever told her family. We know that she grew up in a chaotic household. We know that she struggled with transgenderism, with being the one on the outside, with not having, not fitting in a small community in northern Wisconsin. We know all of these things about her. We know that this was not some kind, she's not a serial killer or a person without feelings or somebody with a cold and black heart. I want to tell you about two cases, and just two cases. 
out of the hundreds of cases that I've witnessed as a homicide lawyer. And the first person I want to tell you about is Brittany Bear. I represented Brittany Bear for like a minute. In other words, I had other homicide cases and someone took her case over, so I didn't get to do her trial. Brittany Bear's case, I find remarkably comparable to Ezra McCandless's. Brittany Bear was a young white woman in her early 20s who killed her boyfriend. She shot him twice in the back of his head while he was laying on a couch. The prosecution in the jury trial said that Brittany Bear shot him while he was sleeping. Brittany Bear had been in a relationship with her boyfriend for a long time. Unlike Ezra McCandless, who had no record, Brittany Bear had a conviction for a burglary. So she was charged, um, and she had some minor misdemeanor on her record that was drug-related, like paraphernalia. She was charged with first-degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. After Brittany Bear shot her boyfriend twice in the back of his head, literally the top back of his head, he was laying on the couch, she went to her mother's house and dropped off her child in Oshkosh. She came back to Milwaukee. Brittany Bear's boyfriend, mother, were calling the grandparents of Brittany's child, saying, where is our son? And she said, I don't know. I haven't seen him. Well, he's missing. What's going on? I don't know. I haven't seen him. The family called the police because he was a missing person. When the police got to the house, what they found was that the homicide had happened in the basement and that Brittany Bear had taken a makeshift or tried to create a makeshift stretcher out of a piece of wood and put the decedent's body on it and tied it up, trying to raise it up the stairs out of the house and conceal the death. When the police came and talked to Brittany Bear, she told the police that there had been a home invasion because her boyfriend was selling drugs and that they had been robbed by drug dealers who had killed her boyfriend and that she had managed to escape. So she made up a complete and total lie. Brittany Bear then used the defense at trial that she was a battered woman. She had an expert witness. The state discovered that prior to killing her boyfriend, she had actually researched the battered woman's defense and that subsequent for killing her boyfriend, she had researched how to dispose the jury found her guilty of first-degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon in possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. As the supervisor of the homicide practice group, I had some involvement in the case to help coach the other lawyers. Annette Morales Rodriguez suffered from some kind of mental health problems, and she wanted nothing more than to have a baby. And in order to keep her boyfriend with her, she lied and said she was pregnant. But she was not pregnant. She began to stalk a friend of hers who was pregnant. And when that pregnant woman came to full term, Annette Morales Rodriguez invited that woman into her home, and she brutally killed her with a knife and cut the baby out. She killed the baby as well. She took the baby to the hospital and claimed that this had been something that had happened during the trauma of childbirth. The hospital determined she had never been pregnant, and then eventually... After some time, the police put it together and found that um, the victim in this case had been murdered by Miss Rodriguez. Miss Rodriguez had a jury trial. The jury found her guilty. She was sentenced to two counts of first-degree intentional homicide in what I think is one of the most aggravated cases I've ever seen, and she was given life without the opportunity to apply for extended supervision. So I take these two cases, because this is the spectrum this court has to deal with, and I ask this court, what end of the spectrum is Ezra McCandless? Where does she fall along these lines? Because our legislature has said, you must serve 20, but they don't say you must serve more than 20. What our legislature has said is that the court can look right now and only decide if a future court can make a decision. And how much do things change? We know that Ezra McCandless is no longer the little girl who picked up a bird nest and put it in her pocket, though she has features of that personality within her. We know that Alex Woodworth will not be able to live out his life and his promise, and that it is a great and tragic loss for the family and the community. We know that Ezra McCandless has shown kindness to other people 
in the jail. We know that while in the jail, she has taken the advantage of every opportunity, as noted in the pre-sentence investigation. We know that she worked in the laundry because she was able to train people for that job. And I've been told gave up her job in the laundry because it was going to a job which she liked, because let's face it, it's no picnic being in the jail. Right. We all know that. And it's not fun. And there's very limited opportunities to move around. Ezra McCandless had this opportunity to move back and forth to the laundry because she's a more trusted inmate who's gotten along very well with the jailers here. She gave that job to another inmate and took it away from herself so that inmate would have a chance to prove to another court that they could be trusted to help that person with sentencing. Ezra McCandless is going to go to prison for 20 years. It is my sincere hope and belief that she will be able to aid other people who are in prison in their struggles. I wrote in my sentencing memo about brain development and juveniles, not because I'm trying to argue to this court that Ezra McCandless is a juvenile. She's an adult. She was barely out of her teen years at the time this offense was committed. She was 20 years old. She had had a birthday and got out of her teen years some five months or so earlier, five to six months earlier. And I think about where people are and where they change. What I wanted to show in my sentencing memo is there was a time where courts around the country were going very heavy into sentencing, to life without supervision, to determinate sentencing, to treating juveniles more and more as adults, and that as the research and the science developed, the United States Supreme Court, in its wisdom, in cases such as Roper versus Simmons and Miller versus Alabama, said, wait a minute, we need to take another look at this jurisprudence because we're looking at science. And we know, as I put in my memorandum and footnoted with the research, that that brain development is not completed until somebody's now in their mid-20s, 25, 26. I mean, it's always been this way. We just didn't know about it. We don't know what future research is going to bring us. We don't know if even the fact of homicide is contained in somebody's brain and if it's treatable. We do know that there's a lot of neuropsychological research and neurological research going on around the country right now. That we know. So what I'm asking for isn't a lenient sentence. I'm asking for somebody to look at that and who Ezra McCandless will be down the road, whether it's 20, 25, 30, whatever courts decide, because she will have the burden of proving to a court that she no longer Okay? I mean, that just seems so silly now, doesn't it? I mean, how many things did people think about 20 years ago that have not come to fruition? In 1975, a fairly famous environmentalist said that by the time we're in now, that we would be at the point, because of global warming, where most of 75% of the Earth's species would have died off. Well, we know that's not true, right? I don't want to get political here. That's not my purpose. My purpose is that future predictions don't come true. All we're asking you to do is to let somebody else take a future look. That's not leniency. I'm not even sure that it's mercy. But it's equitable, and it's just, and it's rational, and it does not depreciate the seriousness of the offense. We have every reason to think things could go in a positive direction from the compass. There is a reason why sentencing has evolved in courts, not just in Wisconsin, but across this nation, across this nation to evidence-based decision-making because we recognize that there is something beyond the pure emotion of something that occurs, something beyond the pure emotion that we can actually look at objective criteria and potentially use that criteria. It's not perfect, okay? It's not perfect. But I will say this, I'm sure out of my 125 homicide cases, I've probably done 80 homicide sentencings and read 80 comp compass reports. I've never seen one like this. Honest to God. I'm an officer of the court. I would not lie. I have never seen a compass report ever where a person who had killed another human being came out like this on a compass report where the only thing was at the high level 
was the homicide itself, and that's always rated at the very highest level. I have seen so many people and met so many people who have killed another human being. And that, I'm sorry to say, for better or for worse, puts me in a pretty particularly unique position. Because, frankly, the people who know the killers the most are the defense lawyers and the jailers. Not the prosecutors, not the courts, not the police officers who take the confessions and solve the cases, but the jailers. The jailers, like Mr. Carlin. Mr. Carlin says, and I think it's quite wise what he wrote in his letter, and I had no idea what he was going to write in advance. He just sent the letter to us. He wrote how as a prison guard, he's had the opportunity to witness people in prison and notice that people generally change after five or ten years. This is what his observations are. And either the changes happen or they don't. So, yes, did Ezra McCandless testify in a manner that was rejected by this jury, that the jury did not believe? <coughs> yes, Ezra McCandless did testify in that matter. Does that mean down the road that somebody shouldn't take another look at who Ezra McCandless is then? This is not leniency. This is not mercy. This is a rational view toward sentencing and change, because we all know that life is about nothing but change. I don't know if Ezra McCandless will ever get out of prison. I know that in all likelihood, if Ezra McCandless gets out of prison, I probably will not be alive by then. As Brian Stevenson said, the power of just mercy is that it belongs to the undeserving. It's when mercy is least expected that it's most potent, strong enough to break the cycle of victimization and victimhood, retribution and suffering. It has the power to heal the psychic harm and injuries that lead to aggression and violence, abuse of power, mass incarceration. The mercy we ask for, the sentence we ask for, recognizes the dynamics of the world of change, of what we don't know, but hopefully somebody will know in the future. It is not leniency. It is not a request to get out of prison. It is a request that hopefully there will be another human being who will look at who Ezra McCandless is in the future, what feelings are there in the future, and what will best serve society at a future date. And that is what we ask for, Your Honor. Thank you very much.